Welcome to my talk, uh, buzzing ac uh, across the eBPF landscape and into the hive. So how many people recognize this logo? And how many people, when you hear this, you can like think of the little jingle that goes along with it too, right? Okay, how many people actually know how x86 works? At the instructions, of, yeah, okay, a few people, because this is this conference, but, right? <laughs> This is kind of like a cultural phenomenon, right? Everybody, like, even my mom knows this too, right? Um, and nobody knows exactly what Intel inside is, but everybody wanted that inside of their laptop. And so, by the end of this presentation, what I'm gonna do for you is show you that what you're gonna want in the future is eBPF inside. And you may not dive down into the kernel code to get that, but I'm gonna show you that the benefits that eBPF brings are gonna want are gonna be what you want inside your applications and inside your infrastructure. So, with that, let's get started. eBPF, you know, I've presented a grand vision for you. Does it really have a, is this all just buzz or is there actually bite to the technology? So where did eBPF actually develop from? So eBPF is a Linux kernel technology or at least came out of Linux kernel. And there's kind of this user space, kernel space paradox that we have. In the Linux kernel, we have system awareness, performance, visibility of everything that's happening in the system, but it's now in over three decades old technology, lacks a little bit of that flexibility that, that we have. In user space, however, where we implement a lot of our applications, it's very programmable. We can do a lot of different things that we want to, but we don't have direct access to those kernel features, those resources. There's another way to do it, kernel modules, but that is kind of a more difficult way to implement things and you can end up breaking your kernel, right? So there's a couple different places that we can implement things, but they all have kind of their trade-offs for that. So the question that kind of came around uh, about almost a decade ago now is, can we add programmability into the Linux kernel? And how can that benefit cloud native environments or even beyond that too? And that's where eBPF came from. eBPF makes the Linux kernel programmable. And kind of like the example that a lot of people like to use is what JavaScript is to the browser, eBPF is to the kernel. So if you think back to early web pages, it was a bit essentially just static information, right? You go to a website and it's presenting information for you. But when we added JavaScript into the browser, suddenly you could have interactive elements suddenly your web page was interacting with what you were doing, right? There was, you could on the fly add new functionality programs and react to what the user was doing in the system. And so that's exactly, or that's very similar to what eBPF is doing for the Linux kernel now. It's able to add new functionality on the fly to do additional things based on user input, right? And so Linus, if you saw him at the keynote yesterday, he said, eBPF has actually been really useful, and the real power of it is how it allows people to do specialized code that isn't enabled until asked for, right? Adding new functionality on the fly, but only when you need it. And so what we're doing with eBPF is dynamic, dynamically changing the kernel behavior, right? And so if you think about kind of this paradox that I was talking about at the beginning, uh, if we think about the traditional Linux kernel development model, uh, we have an application developer, for instance, and they're like, hey, I have this new feature that I want to observe in my application. And he runs over to his very friendly Linux kernel developer and says, can you add this for me? I need this in the Linux kernel, right? And so Linux kernel developer turns around, uh, goes into Linux kernel mailing list where everybody loves to be, and says, you know, just give me one year to convince the whole community that it's good for all this, you know, going past all, all, all the different arguments and stuff. So one year later, finally comes back, he's like, great, I got my patch set merged, it's in the Linux kernel now. But the application developer says, but I need this in my Linux distro, right? Nobody's running the latest re release of the kernel. And so finally five years later, you get it in your LTS release and you said, great, here and now it's shipping for you. But in the meantime, the requirements have changed, right? This isn't a very fast iteration cycle. You don't get the feedback that you need. You can't add functionality that you need on the fly. Development is really measured in years rather than days or weeks, right? And so now eBPF really changed this paradigm 
Because now we can say application developer, I need to observe this new feature, <coughs> right? Goes over to his eBPF developer and he says, right, let me just hack this up. Um, I can solve this with eBPF. And do you know what? You can release that program the same day. Um, and you don't even have to reboot the, reboot the machine. I think there is a really great uh, talk from Brendan Gregg about uh, this at eBPF Summit. And he was saying that he'd be in meetings with customers and he could solve their performance issues or look into the information they wanted to by the end of the meeting to help solve their issues, right? So going from years to hours, that's a really big change in what we can do. And like Brendan Gregg said, this really brings superpowers for the Linux kernel. And that's why you're gonna wanna have eBPF inside. So I've given the grand vision, talked about it a little bit more, but you know like, you're like Linux kernel, this is a very important part of my operating system. Uh, are you sure this is a good idea? So the other thing about eBPF, we're not just kind of like wild westing everything into the Linux kernel. What eBPF also does is does make, makes you have safe and performant changes to the Linux kernel. So the way that eBPF works is that it's essentially programs that are installed into your Linux kernel that only run on specific events. So these eBPF programs aren't running in the background all the time. They're only running when specific triggers or hooks or kfunks are done, and right? So something like a syscall happens and then your eBPF program runs. So it's not something that's running all the time, right? And the really big thing about running in such a, a critical part of your system is safety. And the key part of that is the eBPF verifier. And so the eBPF verifier is a really big piece of code, and essentially what it does is it ensures that your programs will run to completion and they're not gonna crash or otherwise harm the, the system. Because the worst thing that could happen is crashing your kernel, right? Then <laughs> everything's offline. So the eBPF verifier checks every single program before it gets loaded into the Linux kernel and makes sure that it's safe to actually run on the system. And this is really one of the core components of eBPF. Then once it passes through the verifier, we wanna make sure that we really have the performance benefits out of this. We're not just adding more complex code into the system, right? And so eBPF gets a lot of performance benefits by being code actually running in the kernel and being JIT compiled um, too. So it's taking your program bytecode into the machine specific instruction set and it basically runs as fast as natively compiled kernel code, right? So eBPF is both safe and it's extremely performant too. Um, and it's performant across a lot of different use cases. So two examples here, one is on the networking side, uh, doing throughput, being able to increase that. Um, actually, there's some really interesting work that Daniel Borkman, the co-creator of eBPF is doing right now where he can, uh, for containers, he can almost make with eBPF um, go faster than uh, like host network processing, uh, which is quite cool. And then on the right side here, we also see some about like security observability. Um, and so looking at uh, the, the big difference that eBPF allows you to do is to, since it's only running on events, it's not consuming system resources in the background there, so, right? So more performant in a lot of different ways. And then the last thing that you do is we were talking at the beginning about this kind of like user space, kernel space paradise, uh, paradox is that eBPF allows you to also share information uh, across this, right? And this is done through BPF maps and you're sharing this information. So you don't, you're not going to lose data and it's much more performant than other systems too, right? So that's the little background around eBPF. So where is eBPF actually today? So if we're thinking about a lot of systems, so I come from the cloud native world, so I'm gonna talk about Kubernetes, right? Um, we're running a lot of different applications, processes, whatever, in user space, right? But at the end of the day, we're still running one kernel, like per host, right? And all the applications in user space have to make calls to the kernel to do whatever they want to, and the kernel sees everything that's happening. It sees when we want to create a container, uh, create, I, I don't know, a WASM module um, or anything else, do any networking calls, access files, right? The kernel is seeing everything that's happening in user space. And that means eBPF programs can also see everything that's happening in user space. And this doesn't require any changes to the code or the configuration of the applications because the applications are already calling into user space, right? And so 
with eBPF, you're able to see all of this without having to change your application. And so what eBPF actually allows you to do in kernel space is allow you to add that flexibility and programmability into what was before a much more static system. And importantly, it does this in a safe, performant, observable, um, and scalable manner. And the best thing is, eBPF is available almost by default in most modern kernels today. So what are the real world use cases? Are people actually using this in production today? So the first example I would give is networking. So I'm a maintainer of the CNCF project Cilium. If you haven't heard of Cilium before, um, it provides extremely scalable and performant networking in Kubernetes and other environments. And it's used all across um, the world because of these benefits that it brings. A lot of people are converting to Cilium for their networking because of the benefits that eBPF brings. But I think the interesting thing is talking with a lot of users is like they're not choosing Cilium because it's running on eBPF, right? They're choosing e Cilium because it's more performant, it's more scalable, it provides better programmability to solve their specific business use cases. And this ties back to what I was saying at the beginning about this vision for eBPF inside. People are choosing Cilium as the technology, not because it's built on eBPF, but because of the the benefits that eBPF provides to them through the technology. I think you'll see that more and more. The people are gonna choose uh, technologies that are based on eBPF because of the business benefits that it brings them. And so kind of like walking through the history of the Cilium project to show kind of like where like Cilium did, uh, like kind of like built. And so um, intent and identity-based high-performance container networking built on eBPF. So in the beginning, we started with basic container networking. You know, containers were kind of this new paradigm. We needed a new way to wire them all together. And that's what Cilium started as, right? But then an important thing on top of that is network security. And because eBPF is um, operating in the kernel, it has a good understanding of where all your applications are. So it can do much better things like um, firewalling and network policy too. Then because you're, once again, observing everything that's happening in the kernel, you already have all the information. And so then we built Hubble to surface that information to users. And with Hubble, you're pulling information right essentially off the wire to do things like flow logs, metrics, be able to troubleshoot your application. And that's built on eBPF because eBPF is seeing, collecting, and collecting all the information and can just surface it to the user. Then uh, in the Kubernetes world, networking across multiple clusters, um, do, doing that, uh, doing things like standalone uh, load balancer, right? Because as we saw, um, eBPF can really increase performance. Uh, I think one of my favorite stories from the Selenium community is they switched uh, from IPVS to eBPF for their lo load balancer, and they actually thought the system was broken because the CPU usage decreased so much. <laughs> they're like, it's basically like a flat line. <laughs> they're like, are we sure this is correct? Uh, but uh, everything was uh, working, right? So bring those performance benefits in, into load balancing too. Uh, doing things around service mesh, so like load balancing and, and tracing, yeah. And then moving on to the observability. So I touched a little bit it on Hubble right now, but there's a lot more eBPF projects around observability um, too. And so like Hubble pulls all that information off of the wire or essentially out of the kernel and can surface it directly uh, to the user and create, can create things like a service map, um, right? So eBPF is the core of this because it allows us to surface all that information from the kernel. Pulling up things like metrics. And then uh, security is also, I think, a really hot topic. Um, and since eBPF can see everything that's going on inside your kernel, uh, it can surface any relevant uh, security information for you too. So projects like Pixie, like Falco, um, for things like sensitive file access. And then as a sub-project to Cilium, uh, there's also Tetragon too. And it provides you security observability, and it essentially allows you to surface any information from the kernel and bring it into user space so that you can take actions on it. Um, and so besides just kind of like having that information, it allows you also to do runtime enforcement too. So you say there's a malicious processor, then you're able to kill it. 
And since all this is happening in the kernel, it can all happen in real time too. And the last big use case for eBPF is tracing and profiling too. So since you're able to understand all the calls that are happening in your application, um, you can kind of uh, trace all that, profile your application, and really increase uh, the performance of your application too. So really what eBPF tools allow you to do is to kind of collect rich context-aware context event streams and then make specific actions on that. Because you're doing this all in the kernel, it allows you to do it in a very performant way, and you're able to see everything that you need to. Right, so I guess the question is, should we sprinkle a little bit of eBPF on top of everything? It sounds like this magic bullet um, that can solve all the world's ills. But unfortunately, it's not. Um, eBPF is a very complex technology, um, and it's a specific tool um, for very specific use cases. Um, a lot of eBPF projects right now could be replaced by just, you know, shell scripts, right? I, I think this is an important thing to keep in mind. Like eBPF, uh, or like any other technology, eBPF is a, a specific thing that you're trying to do. Um, if you aren't writing kernel code, like eBPF may not be the best tool for your job, right? And so you need to think about like the actual use cases. But I think the thing that is special about eBPF is that there's a lot of applications, kind of as I talked about in the last section, they're using eBPF under the hood that allow you to have the power of eBPF without having to write kernel code, right? It, it's the same thing right now today. Like a lot of people don't write their own uh, Linux kernels, right? But a lot of people use distributions or other packages of it to allow them to do things that they want to. Right, and so that's why I was saying a lot of people are gonna be using applications that leverage eBPF, but not everybody else, everybody is going to be writing kernel, uh, eBPF programs themselves. Because another thing that eBPF programs really miss is, right, what, what you're seeing at the bottom here is what eBPF sees. See, open file, forward packet, read that. When in reality, what your customer wants to do is add product X to my shopping cart, right? And so being able to translate from what the user, what the application is trying to do into actually what's happening in the kernel is quite a difficult thing. And so you're gonna to need to have some type of translation layer in between there. Like for example, in, in Cilium, we're not writing network policy and like open this port and, and send packets through it. We're saying uh, this identity can talk to this, like front end can talk to back end, right? And so people are gonna be leveraging applications because eBPF is still a very low level technology. And eBPF really is challenging. It doesn't have the business context as I was talking about in the last slide. It really requires in-depth kernel knowledge and you need to be able to know what's happening. And because you're seeing everything that's happening in the kernel, just the data volumes around it can be absolutely absurd. So with the pros, the cons, let's talk a little bit about what's actually happening in the eBPF community right now. So this is actually the first patch set um, from Daniel getting eBPF into the kernel. Um, and as you can see, it was Friday the 28th of March 2014. So I, I guess, yeah, we're actually just over a decade in, into eBPF. And so what's happened in the last decade? Well, there's really been an explosion of things happening around eBPF. Um, there's a lot of applications that are using it. So Cilium, which I'm a maintainer of, BPF Trace, Falco, Pixie, Calico. These are what we say are the major applications, the really big projects. And there's also so many more emerging pro projects focusing on a variety of different use cases all around eBPF. Not only that, there's also a lot of work being done in the infrastructure space, both on the compiler and different use cases, um, like user space libraries or translating it to um, hardware too. It's also very active. Companies are building and creating value on top of eBPF. Uh, this is just a list of a couple of different companies that have been acquired uh, in the eBPF space. My own company, uh, Isovalent, is one of those. We just got acquired by Cisco last Friday, so that was kind of a fun thing too. Um, eBPF isn't just a Linux kernel technology. It's being, rep uh, it's being ported to Windows, and it's also going through the standardization process at the IETF right now as kind of like a, a, a standard way to implement eBPF. So I think you're gonna be seeing this technology in more and more places. And so if all this has kind of gotten you excited about eBPF, where should you go next? And these are kind of 
the resources that I'll leave you with. So like anything good, any good thing on the internet, eBPF has a Wikipedia page. This is a good jumping off point to get uh, a, a start. Then the next resource that, that I would recommend is actually eBPF.io. This is a project maintained by the community. And it's not only available in English, it's available in a variety of different languages. Um, so if you want to send this to somebody else in your network that speaking a different language, um, do that. I'm also maintaining eBPF.io. So if you want to help translate into a different language, please come talk to me afterwards. And I'd love to be able to, uh, yeah, I guess spread more information about eBPF um, in, in different languages so to make the project more accessible to different people. Um, on eBPF.io, there's different labs where you can dive into the code and understand how to get started. Each year, there's also an eBPF summit that's kind of giving the uh, latest developments in the technology and how people are using it. Uh, the next one will be in September and will be launched pretty soon, too. Uh, I run a weekly eBPF newsletter. There's an eBPF documentary that really tells the origin story of how it's done. Uh, it's very much done in the Netflix Marvel style. It was probably one of my favorite projects of last year. Uh, so I'd recommend if you have 30 minutes, this is the one thing that I'd rec recommend checking out because there's a lot of great personalities in the eBPF space. And I, I think this documentary really captures it. Um, also wrote a book, B Buzzing Across Space, The Illustrated Children's Guide to eBPF. I have a few copies up here if you want to learn about this in a more basic format. And this seemed like a good jumping off point. The eBPF Foundation produced a state of eBPF report to give to your execs, your C-suite, your CTO, CISO, or whatever. And the eBPF Foundation is now supporting academic research, too, uh, in the ecosystem. So kind of across everything that I'll um, talk to you, um, the, the one thing, example that I'm going to leave you with is, right, so the iPhone was revolutionary because before you'd kind of get a cell phone and have a bunch of programs installed, and you'd be like, this is the functionality that I have today. And the iPhone came along and changed that whole paradigm because there was an app store. Suddenly you could download new functionality onto your phone. You know, you're in a new location, you download Google Maps and you can figure out how to get around. You're hungry, you download Uber Eats, Grubhub, and suddenly you can order food. Whatever you're trying to do, you can download a new application to change the functionality on the phone to do exactly what you want to do. And this is what eBPF is allowing you to do. It's allowing you to add new functionality into the Linux kernel on the fly to accomplish exactly what you want or need to do. And so that's why in the future, your applications, your infrastructure, you're going to want to have the stamp of eBPF inside. Not because eBPF is cool, it has a good uh, kind of jingle that your mom will remember. It's because of what it'll allow you to do. It'll allow you to do faster networking, better observability, increased security, kind of these business level benefits that applications and infrastructure running eBPF will allow you to do will be why you want eBPF inside. So with that, thank you for coming today. And yeah, ask me if you have any questions. Yeah, so there's the, the question is e eBPF on the Windows side is trying to do signing. Is there any efforts on the, the, the Linux side? <laughs> I would say this is a topic under hot debate right now in the uh, eBPF community, especially around kind of it's the classic like who's watching the watchman, right? eBPF sees everything and is doing all these things in your kernel. Who's watching that? Um, there's a lot of different opinions on this <laughs> in the community, and like like signing kind of is a part of that. Essentially, like how do we orchestrate? How do we manage all the eBPF programs? Because if you know this vision of eBPF inside, more and more applications are going to be using eBPF, and I think there's a lot of debate right now in the kernel community around the best way to do that. Um, people have different opinions. I I don't want to say this is the way to do that because I I think it's still an open problem being worked on right now. <laughs> 
I'm not familiar exactly with that use case. Um, I know a lot of people are using, like a, a, another example similar to that is XTP, which is like kind of like eBPF that you're installing right on Nix. And so it'll process packets before it even comes like into the Linux kernel networking stack. I know there's some stuff to like speed up storage too. Uh, I think the hard thing is like eBPF is such a flexible technology. It's being applied to like so many different like, like places and people find new applications for it all the time. Like one of the most interesting things um, that I found recently was like there was uh, some bug in like a human interface device, like something like a, like a touchpad or something and they were able to install an eBPF program to fix the bug without having to fix like the actual thing in the upstream Linux kernel because it's a long release cycle and stuff. So on the storage side, I've seen a couple things about like how eBPF can be used to like speed up storage but I don't know specifically what you're talking about. Um, so the one I just gave about like the like the like interface device is uh, is one of the examples. Um, I think the hard thing about like the embedded world is it depends on if you have like a Linux kernel running on the system because a lot of the things are like too small to actually run a full kernel. Well, I'm, yeah, Linux kernel. What? Uh, okay. Ah, okay. Embedded Linux. Um, I, I, I'm not like super familiar um, with that because like we work more in like the server data center side, but I, I'm sure like people are doing doing stuff too, because of this flexibility that it kind of allows you to do. Uh, do you have an example of where you would still write a kernel module where where it would be easier uh, to take that path than than eBPF? Like you have something kind of recommendation? Uh, if you don't want to try to pass the eBPF verifier. Go with the kernel module. <laughs> um, I would say, I say that kind of tongue in cheek because a lot of people have uh, problems, at, like essentially getting past the verifier because it's like this kind of like mission critical, safety critical like system that's like blocking, like is checking if we should allow this in. So it blocks a lot of things. I know a lot of people get frustrated and waste days of their life, you know, trying to get something past the eBPF verifier. And like, they're always trying to improve it and like make it and like essentially allow um, like more complex like programs and stuff. But like obviously with the kernel module, you don't have to pass the eBPF verifier, but then you're risking other things too. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so, so essentially that is running to completion. Though, like kind of the verifier is always like kind of improving. Um, so there's actually a talk at KubeCon about uh, eBPF limitations, uh, uh, myths and truths. And I, it's, it's on YouTube, I'd recommend checking it out. And they kind of showed there like with the improvements in the verifier and kind of like how eBPF programs are allowed to be built now, they showed an example where they're running uh, Conway's Game of Life in eBPF. So there's a lot of things you can do, it's just kind of figuring out the right way to do it, that it's in a safe way that it passes the eBPF verifier. It sounds very much like running a Lambda or just running your own app. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Maybe that particular function in terms of can be implemented or use eBPF mechanisms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're we're seeing that a, a, a lot right now. I, I think the fun thing about eBPF is it kind of like re like re speeds up the innovation cycle in the Linux kernel, right? Is we can like experiment new ways to do things, like you know, we, um, and if I think we can experiment with a lot of things without having to get the buy-in from the whole community. We can figure out what is the best things and then hopefully some of the learnings from eBPF can also be upstreamed into the kernel so then it's available for everyone too. Did that answer your question? Um, sort of, I, I see eBPF as a separate thing, a separate framework. Yeah. From all the existing frameworks in the Linux kernel. Yeah. 
um, I, I think it's kind of both. Like you don't want to just kind of like abandon the Linux kernel. It was, it was built that way for a while for that thing. But it's it's and eBPF doesn't mean you have to not use any part of the Linux kernel too. I, I think what we're finding in Cilium is we can reuse parts where we need it, but we don't have to use it all the time. And I, I think that's kind of like the power. And right. Linux is deployed on billions of devices around the world, from like the embedded Linux space to like servers to the Mars rover, right? And so it's in all these different things. And some people are going to need some things, and some people are going to need other things. So it's hard to say like you should only do things in the eBPF or you should only do things in the kernel because there's so many different use cases. And I think it's figuring out like does the Linux kernel work for you, the use case that you're trying to solve? If not, can I do this in eBPF? And it's like talking about that for the specific use cases. It's hard to make a, a blanket statement about this is, though, we, we very, very much are like eBPF optimists and we're seeing a lot of benefits um, from what it allows you to do. Yeah, and I think eBPF is always improving all the time. This is kind of like what I was talking about, the improvements of the eBPF verifier too, where originally there was like a, like a 4K instruction set limit, and now it's like a million. So it's always expanding. And I, I think we're always seeing improvements in the system, but you always have to, and you, you're never pretty much creating something from scratch, so you have to incrementally improve things too. Yeah, um, the eBPF verifier is an extremely complex piece of code. Um, I would recommend there's some talks from eBPF Summit. Like, eBPF verifier is at least a whole talk, maybe a whole workshop by itself, so it'd be hard to dive into it. I would recommend checking out some of the talks from eBPF Summit talking about exactly how it works and some of the limitations and uh, some of the challenges and how to overcome them, too. Um, cause I, don't want to give you a limited answer right now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think these are both like two hot topics right now. So like KTLS um, is like an interesting topic and also various different opinions in the kernel community. Um, there's actually also talk for KubeCon, uh, from KubeCon uh, from one of my coworkers or two of my coworkers, John and Natalia. I'd actually recommend checking out that if you want to learn kind of the state of the art because that's one of the things that John is working in, on in the upstream kernel. Um, so there's a whole talk on that that I'd recommend watching. And then for like layer seven processing, so like as I was saying, like Cilium started out with like kind of like L3 networking and has gradually like moved up the stack. And um, kind of what we're seeing is, and I think you kind of like see this kind of a lot over the history of Linux is first uh, things start in like user space. So like a lot of L7 stuff is done in user space right now, um, but that functionality then moves into the kernel, right? Like there used to be um, a lot of like user space TCP IP networking stacks, right? And then that moved into the kernel. And so I think as we move forwards, as eBPF as a technology um, improves, uh, we're gonna see 
kind of more functionality move from user space into kernel space. It's just like getting to there and developing the technology until that point um, is like what we're working on right now. So like some things like that we can do right now is like it, like in the in the kernel we can do like HTTP parsing uh, in the kernel with eBPF um, right now. Um, but some other parts of L7 processing, we just rely on Envoy um, to do. So it depends on the specific use case, but I, I think what we're seeing with eBPF as a technology and like the verifier and everything else, it continually improves. And so, you know, kind of the limitations are, are slowly like moving away and what we're able to do with eBPF is always increasing too. Any more questions? Okay, cool. Um, thanks for coming, and yeah, come up for a book afterwards. <laughs>